With a keen eye for the absurdities and complexities of this burgeoning psychedelic renaissance, there is one maverick mind who doesn't just observe the unfolding narratives surrounding the emergent psychedelic industry, they dissect it, lampoon it, and illuminate its intricacies with a blend of wit, insight, and humor. Our current landscape teems with passionate discourse on the transformative power of mushrooms, be it psilocybin's medicinal promise, the ancient echoes of cultural reverence, or the hope of spiritual awakening sought by many modern seekers. And amidst all this noise, he cuts through the underbrush of commercialization and commodification, offering a content that is both entertaining as well as enlightening. And he does all this while shedding light on their profound historical and spiritual roots. This man is evolving the conversation around psychedelics, inviting us to ponder the confluence of the sacred and profane, the medicinal and the recreational, the historical significance, and the modern obsession with mushrooms. All while making us laugh, reflect, and form a deeper understanding of this social phenomenon. So join me as we get to know Dennis Walker, the mycopreneur. You're listening to the Myco Geeky Podcast, a podcast that inspires people to grow mushrooms at home to improve their mental, emotional, and physical health. Most people call him geeky, and he is a passionate mushroom cultivator advocate and educator every week he sits down with fellow cultivators mushroom educators scientists and therapists to discuss the various ways people can approach mushroom cultivation and how mushrooms can be used to improve their lives all right what's up everybody welcome to the Myco geeky podcast the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at home mushroom cultivation game i am your host Myco geeky and we got a great episode tonight you know uh i don't want to formally name these episodes but these are like the the rare gems of the internet of our Myco internet community um you know fungi florist bonsai fungi um, we've had a lot of interesting characters on here. Um, you know, they're not just traditional, you know, bread and butter cultivators, but they're, they're doing something a little different in the myco space. Well, this guy is no exception to the rule. He, uh, he's a satirist. He makes fun of stuff. Guess what he makes fun of? He pokes fun at us. He pokes fun at our, uh, our psychedelic renaissance, our, uh, our profound trips, our ego deaths, all the stuff that we love to talk about. And in doing so, he gives us, uh, you know, some, some points to ponder things to think about. And, uh, I, I can't tell you how excited I am to sit down and get to talk with him, uh, learn from him, get his perspective. This guy is just a gem. I'm talking about the mycopreneur. Uh, on Instagram. He, you can also check him out at mycopreneur.com. That's M-Y-C-O-P-R-E-N-E-U-R.com. Um, Dennis Walker, he's a cool dude. Um, we're going to talk to him. First, I'm going to, I'm going to toss up this mission statement. I had somebody message me this week. They said, you know, what's your long-term plan here? What are you, what are you really doing this all for? And I said, man, I'm, I, I'm going to keep it real simple for you. Here it is. This is what we're doing. This is truly what I'm doing this for. I was raised, uh, you know, we go over to a friend's house. The kids, you know, we all played. We made a mess before we left. We had to clean it up. My mom always said, you got to leave a place in better shape than you found it. That's what I'm trying to do in this space. And so uh, my mission statement is keep me on track. It's this easy. We're educating and inspiring mushroom cultivators and enthusiasts on the art and science of mushroom cultivation while delving into the medicinal, therapeutic, and societal aspects of mushrooms, including discussions on integration therapy, spirituality, and the decriminalization movement. So tonight, social aspects. That's what we're doing. We're talking about the social aspects. A little bit of other stuff, but definitely the social. Um, sorry, man. Geeky had a late, late night last night. Um, trying to get some sterilizers done before Christmas, um, the holidays. Sorry, guys. I know some of you guys. Uh, I was brought up, it was Christmas, probably always going to call it Christmas. Anyway, I, I, I love Hanukkah. I love Kwanzaa. I love oh, the winter solstice. 
I love all that stuff. I'm an atheist, so it doesn't matter anyway. But anyway, uh, shout out to my Patreon supporters. You guys are the best. I keep saying this over and over again. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, we're, we're working on Patreon. We're, we're going to beef it up. We're going to do some special things. Uh, I, I, I owe it to you guys. So, so we're, we're working on that. Some new content in the coming year. Geeky's new year's resolution is, uh, you know, I talk to a lot of people. I get their perspective all the time. We're always trying to talk about their perspective. Uh, I got a, I got a process for growing. It works. Uh, I love it. I think I have a unique perspective on, um, just how to think about growing. So we're going to do some content around that in the new year. Just want to let everybody know, uh, be on the lookout for that. Got a couple other, uh, you know, not podcast content, uh, style things we're going to be working on as well, just to try to do more for you guys, uh, give you guys better information, uh, better perspective. Um, we are just seeing this community grow by leaps and bounds literally every day. And, uh, we got to do some educating. So that's what I'm here for. Um, what else we got going on here? Um, oh yeah. Mutant grow along. Sorry guys. I think I mentioned this last week. Um, I got a little, little eager. Um, didn't realize that maybe starting this grow along, uh, shipping everything out during the holidays was probably not the pro move. So we will be shipping, uh, we'll be starting this, uh, beginning of next year. Uh, great New Year's resolution, guys. Number one on everybody's New Year's resolution. If you haven't already grown mutants, uh, grow some mutants with us here. It should be a fun grow along. Um, so stay tuned for that. That will be in the new year. Uh, what else we got going on this week? Oh, yeah. Hold on. So I, I, uh, my wife was on a business trip. We decided to go visit some people. I had not been back to L.A. in over five years uh, a lot of people, uh, I missed and hadn't gotten to see. So we made a quick little trip out of it. And, uh, while I was there, I got to hang out with a couple of my mushroom homies. So I got to hang out, uh, one of my really old school buddies on Instagram, uh, been friends with him for quite a while. He's a cool guy. We both like ska, um, talking about skank and mushroom. This guy, oh, look at that guy, a little hair on there. Sorry guys. In my HD, you can probably see the hair. Oh, there's another one. Anyway, uh, Skank and Mushroom, he's on Instagram. Super cool guy. Definitely knows how to grow mushrooms. Uh, got to hang out with him, meet him uh, for the first time. And then, uh, you know, she's, well, she hasn't been in the news, but her, uh, her very cool stickers uh, made the news recently. And uh, I, I, I managed to get the updated sticker. So I'm a little, I'm a little nervous. I don't know if I want to put this one on my flow hood. I don't know if I'm going to jinx myself, but I'm talking about old Miss Mush SoCal. Uh, so yeah, I got to hang out with those two. Uh, it was fun. We, we went to the LA Arboretum and, uh, checked out some nature. It was a good time. Uh, I I'm telling you right now this year, what this year has helped me figure out is I love, one of the reasons I love doing the podcast is to connect with people, um, can meet people that I talk to, you know, in our little imaginary versions of ourselves on, on the internet. I just love getting to actually talk to people, but man, getting to actually meet people even better. So yeah, uh, I want to shout you guys out, Miss Mush and Skankin. Uh, thanks for coming out, hanging, hanging with Geeky. I, I, I had a great time. Uh, all right. So I think it's about that time. Uh, we're going to talk to Dennis. Uh, but first I thought I would just pull up here. Let me do this. Um, so he hosts a podcast. He was doing this before me. I didn't invent anything. Uh, I guess that, that credits, a, that's a Joe Rogan thing. He really kind of set the tone for podcasting, didn't he? Um, anyway, but he's been doing, uh, Michael focused, uh, psychedelic focused podcasting for quite a while. I think he's over 160 episodes. Check this out. Let me uh, just give you a little smattering here of all these episodes. Look at this. So when you guys message me and you're like, man, what I've listened to all your podcasts. What else should I listen to? Here you go, guys. Here you go. We're not even done yet. We're still scrolling. We're still scrolling. It's a lot of podcasts. A lot of podcasts. There you go. Michael Preneur. 
So that is, uh, let me pull this up here now. And then uh, also, let me just real quick, I'm going to give you a taste of his Instagram. Okay, here we go. We got the Instagram up. So it it's real. Uh, so he recently lost his uh, main Instagram. He's got a new one. It's Micopreneur Official. I think he used to have over twenty thousand followers. He's he's got a thousand. So uh, just go on Instagram right now, guys. If you got Instagram, make sure you're following uh, Dennis Walker. He's awesome. Uh, let's just pull one up to watch here real quick. All right, I like this one. Grand Rising fam. Welcome to the colony, an intentional community for change makers. Think of it like the Selena co-working space of medicine communities, a place where ex-Twitter employees and libertarians come together on foreign soil and cartoonishly romanticize various cherry-picked elements of indigenous wisdom traditions. We share everything at the colony. Your membership dues include unlimited access to entheogenic ceremonies, and a variety of local shamans to choose from. It's like Netflix for ceremonies, and you can cancel at any time. Every member of the colony is assigned two local concierges sourced from a nearby village. They're here to make sure that you're comfortable and that your every whim is catered to. There are no brands or logos visible at the colony, and nobody cares about your social status on the outside because inside of the colony, we're all one, free from transactional relationships, because your membership dues covered all of those. Inside of the colony, we're free. If you want to do hop A and ibogaine at 7.30 in the morning and jump on a live stream for your LinkedIn audience, you're free to do so. Because the only rule at the colony is to follow the abundance codes provided by Gaia, just the way nature intended it. All right, there it is. So you guys got a taste now. You got a taste. He's funny. He's, uh, he's poking a little fun at us. It's okay. We need it, right? We need it. It's healthy. Can't take ourselves too seriously for sure. Um, so anyway, I've been trying to get him on for a while. Not going to lie. Um, he played hard to get a little bit. Um, but, you know, Geeky's, Geeky's persistent. And, and sooner or later, the time is right. And, and we, we cast the, the rod. We get a nibble. We, we, we reel him in. And uh, I, I think... I, th I think this this was a good one, man. I can tell you right now, I had an absolute blast talking to him. So let's just get right into it. Without further ado, Dennis Walker, Michael Prenor. All right, welcome to the show, Dennis Walker. What's up, dude? What's up? Thanks for the invite. Hello, everybody. Hey, man. Uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, I just got to let everybody know, watching on Instagram, in the Michael community, I have, you know, a cherished little basket of people that I absolutely love who are just integral to what keeps me coming back to Instagram and having a presence there. And uh, you are definitely one of those people for sure. A true gem, a, a shining facet of this community. I uh, can't say enough good things about what you're doing on there. Well, thanks for setting the bar high. I'm looking forward to limboing under it and lower, lowering expectations here. Right. So thanks again for the invite. Uh, no problem. All right, man. So just so you know, uh, I misspelled Michaelpreneur like seven times before I finally figured it out, which is sad because I actually took French in high school. So uh, thank you for uh, brushing up on my my spelling skills. Uh, e U R. That's that was a sticking point for me. Yeah, so anyway. it's common. It's a common mistake. So I take no offense ever. All right, cool. All right. So who the fuck are you? Tell me about you. Like, I, be, I, I want to know you beyond the thongs. We'll get to the thongs. We'll get to your biting satire. We'll get to your genius. But just start off, who are you? Yeah, great question. First things first, grew up in San Diego, California. Had a very prototypical suburban Southern California upbringing, which inevitably brought me across mushrooms, right? Uh, cannabis first. And then mushrooms, usually the same people had cannabis and mushrooms and other substances. And I grew up hosting exchange students from all over the world. So I think that's a very seminal part of my upbringing. And that also caused me very early on to start questioning a lot of the popular narratives that were rolled out about who the United States are, about what the American culture is. You know, when you have 
a young mind molded by direct interactions with people from Ghana and Venezuela, former Soviet Union, you start to entertain the possibility that there are other narratives and other realities that maybe we don't all see. And I think that's what accelerated when I found out about mushrooms. I started reading about them. I started hearing stories about them. I found Terrence McKenna. I found Arrowhead. You know, th this was 2005 around then when I really started to become interested in them. Had my first mushroom experience in 2006 in a very recreational setting. It was a half eighth of mushrooms. And as so many of us have experienced, that first cathartic experience opened my mind to the possibilities that there was a lot more going on in the world that I wasn't being told about. So that kind of led me down a rabbit hole of reading a lot of Arrowhead trip reports, which inevitably led me to reading Jonathan Ott and Terrence McKenna and all kinds of different accounts available online. And I also feel very fortunate that this was prior to social media and prior to the insane hype cycle that's going on around psychedelics right now. I had never heard of microdosing. I didn't hear about that even through college. Had never heard of integration. All I knew about was there were a handful of really eccentric thinkers like McKenna and you know a historical precedent looking back at Maria Sabina and Huautla and these different lineages. And I wanted to read and consume everything I could get my hands on. So I guess that's the basis for what really got me interested in mushrooms. And around that time, I started playing in bands. I think there was a connection there. You know, you have a psychedelic experience. And the next thing, you want to emulate the 60s. You want to be Jimi Hendrix. And you want to, you know, dive into this pantheon of legendary musicians who largely were using psychedelics, right? Learning about the Beatles psychedelic era and so on and so forth. So that kind of kicked my personal interest in mushrooms, specifically into high gear. And just around that, I started reading everything I could about things like peyote and ayahuasca. And I was really drawn to the naturally occurring psychedelics. I had handfuls of experiences with various other compounds, but nothing hit like mushrooms did. It seemed to work really well with my personality. I've always kind of been a little bit of a kooky, eccentric, fringe character in a lot of the circles I'm in. And when I had those first couple of mushroom experiences, I felt so embodied and so aligned in myself that, hey, I'm a little bit of an oddball, a little bit of a weirdo, but I also think mushrooms kind of carry that personality as well. You know, a forgotten kingdom, like never learned about mushrooms in any serious way in high school or in college. It was just kind of this like whole unexplored, vast arena that I wanted to sink my teeth further into. And I guess that's what got me on the trajectory I'm on today. Love it, man. So, uh, you know, you and I, uh, both in bands, both weird, uh, we're a type in this community for sure. Um, a lot of people into music, a lot of people into music, a lot of people, uh, I, I think once you have those trips, you, like you said, you just see the world completely differently. Uh, I, I only hosted one exchange student when I was in high school, he was from Japan but he was constantly giving me feedback and perspective about how dumb we were. Um, and like, you know, uh, he, so he graduated high school. Then he did his 13th grade with us. He took all the AP classes with me and he, uh, at the end of the year, we we're all sitting around at a table last day of school. And I was like, so yo, Hey, what, did, you know, what did you think? How, how was uh, American school? He just looks at me, he shakes his head and he goes so easy. And I'm like, wow, we're dumb. Like, you know, <laughs> our AP classes for him was simple. And, and I, so I, I couldn't agree more. I can only imagine if you had multiple exchange students, you just had such a gift at that age to just start questioning everything and then couple that with psychedelic experience. Now you're just going, man, I want to understand the world. I want to, I want the bigger picture. How big of a picture can I have about it? And I see that in, in what you're doing all the time. So kudos to you for that. Cheers. Um, now, so before micropreneur, what did you do? What were you doing? Who were you before this persona? Love it. Well, let's trace the trajectory a little bit, but. One thing I omitted from my upbringing is that I was a very competitive baseball player. So I played sports very seriously. That was my main focus in high school. I was a decent student. I got, you know, 3.3 GPA or whatever, but my primary focus was on the baseball field. And that led to year round competition and eventually to a division one 
baseball team opportunity. I played at the University of San Francisco of all places. Yeah. So okay. there was this perfect storm of elements that came together around my freshman year when I was 18. When I had enrolled at USF, I was on the team. I was doing practice with them. It was a very high level of competition, right? Where you have 4.30 a.m. workouts, super intense physical conditioning, you're traveling, so on and so forth. Played a summer league in Oregon. That was for all intents, my purpose and my career track was to pursue professional baseball. Now, around the same time when I started to get really interested in mushrooms specifically, then it started to call into question a lot of the culture around US sports at that time. I've come to appreciate it very much, but I didn't find any commonality with a lot of people on the team. I was interested in learning about Mad Honey and Nepal and talking about Curanderismo and the Peruvian Amazon and talking about high dose mushrooms. I had had a seven gram solo mushroom trip at that point that really blew the lid off my imagination, full on visual experience. And at a quite young age too, where I wasn't as maybe contaminated with a lot of the traumas and challenges of the world. I was in a very fortunate, stable, happy place and I got a full send dialed in. So once that happened, I started to really question my connection to a lot of the culture because the baseball culture, at, even in San Francisco, it was essentially, let's crush a 30 pack of Bud Light together. Let's watch ESPN. Let's talk shit, be bullies. And, and there was that whole kind of like alpha male, red-blooded sports culture. But a lot of my early psychedelic experiences pushed me kind of away from that and pushed me more into thinking more about the artistic legacy of the world and, you know, the more sensitive emotional landscapes that for all, all intents and purposes still don't get really dealt with in a lot of alpha male, alpha male sports culture, right? So that was kind of what shaped my upbringing up until college. I got a degree in media studies, which was an awesome place to do it in San Francisco, working with independent cinema, playing in bands and doing concerts and just kind of connecting to the whole rich artistic community at that time. Uh, so that shaped a lot of who I was. And then right out of college, I was playing in bands. We did some tours. That was also kind of the career track. But as many people can attest to, that's a pretty difficult career track, especially once you need to start being financially responsible for yourself and so on and so forth. So I gave it a really concerted effort, pun intended, with concerts. And, you know, around 23 or 24, I realized like, hey, this is going to be a tough lifestyle. And, you know, I didn't get the whole Coachella headlining track that we were going for. And that was okay, you know? So I went into education and that caused me, among other factors, to keep a lot of my psychedelic experiences very personal and very contained within my immediate circle. I went into education right off the bat, got a teaching job in Saudi Arabia of all places. So, you know, and, and mind you, throughout my college experience, I had many more mushroom experiences, DMT, basically anything I could get my hands on that was psychoactive. You know, San Francisco, right next to the hate, connected to a lot of arts and tech circles. There was a lot of good compounds floating around. So, you know, my freshman year, I remember I had a gram of DMT, of like really high quality DMT. That was an atypical college experience in 2007 or so. 2CB, mescaline, the night that Obama was elected, I remember in San Francisco, the streets went crazy. I'd never seen a political atmosphere like that, like people actually partying over a political nomination. And I took mescaline that night. So it was just sort of that culture, like going, you know, smoking weed with Sublime with Rome, getting to hang out with all these different artists, uh, Ariel Pink and people like that as a bit of a throwback. That was kind of my, my circle and what got me really excited. So ended up getting into education, basically because it was a job offer. It was like, hey, here's a job offer. You can say yes or no. I thought, yeah, I'll try this. Parlayed that into another opportunity, ended up teaching high school for a couple of years at a very hippie school too. It wasn't at all like a, a typical high school experience. It was a project-based learning school that was founded by Bill Gates and Erwin Jacobs of Qualcomm. So they did things very differently. They had a lot of funding and I taught multimedia to freshmen. So nice. that was kind of my, my track, did that for a number of years. And then honestly, when the pandemic hit is when everything shifted, just like for so many people, the school downsized immediately before the pandemic, fortuitously, my position was cut and it was one of those gifts in disguise, right? Where at the time, within two weeks, my wife and I were evicted from our apartment because the building sold. So through no fault of our own, the developers or the 
property managers came and they said, hey, you got to find a new place. Everyone in the building has 60 days to leave. And in that same two weeks, I got let go of my teaching job. And in that same period of time, my wife was undergoing cancer treatment. So it was like this, again, mm. perfect storm of just like, what the fuck is happening right now? And yes, I'm fortunate I come from a stable background where I could go to my parents and live there. I did that for a while, but like that's super uninspiring as a 27 year old to like move back in with mom and dad. I wasn't having it. So that's when I kind of kicked everything into high gear and thought, all right, I got to really go out there and get it and figure out a way to make this happen. And uh, the pandemic hit right around that time. It was like late 2019, early 2020, when all of this was going down. And then uh, that threw everything for a loop. And at that point, I really decided to come out of the psychedelic closet, so to speak, and establish Mycopreneur, which is based on, at that point, like 12 to 13 years of a lot of personal experiences all over the planet. And I think that's essentially what made it successful early on, is that it was sort of a long time coming. You know, it wasn't just like I established it. It was like, hey, I have this set of skills. I have this prolonged set of life experiences. It's time for me to share this, to tap into my network and to try to legitimize some of this discussion around psilocybin mushrooms and psychedelics that for so long have been marginalized, have been pushed underground and have not been tolerated in polite society. I love that. Um, well, the the pandemic, you know, a uh, silver lining opportunity on so many levels for so many people. Um, but no fun. I don't know if you've had COVID. I didn't like it. I do not recommend. Uh, I got hit hard this summer out of nowhere because I was one of those people who was like, hey, this thing's done. Went to a festival. That's I, I never actually got tested for it, but I've never had an illness like I picked up there. And it was very respiratory in nature. So I imagine that's what it was. So I quarantined, but it was rough. Yeah, it's no fun. Um, well, so that's awesome because uh, I can tell you this right now. Um, I have on many occasions watching uh, some of your uh, videos on Instagram thought to myself, I have a feeling this guy is like doing the greatest thing you could possibly do with a liberal arts education. I feel like this is just exactly right. Now you are even more amplified because you've traveled the world. You've had world travelers spend time with you. You've really gotten to know them, not just like visit for a week, you know, somewhere and leave. I'm assuming you really became friends with the, with those, uh, exchange students. And then you went to Saudi Arabia, you're going and working at a Bill Gates school. I'm sure very diverse. So you are just, you're just nothing but perspective. I love that. And then I also love how you're not just doing short videos that are hilarious. You're also writing these onion ask, um, art news articles, uh, on your site, uh, you know, in conjunction with all your podcasting, which is also phenomenal. You're bringing on really interesting people. Um, and the whole time I'm just thinking, well, this guy's quite a writer, but not just a writer who just sits in the corner of a room and, you know, goes on a, a, a rant about whatever they care about. This is like this contextualized, deep perspective, broad perspective kind of writing. And you're just so eloquently and sophisticatedly and slyly educating so many people who maybe wouldn't want to sit down and read a boring article from Huffington Post. Sorry, Huffington Post, but right, like we're over your headlines, guys. We get it. We get it. Your your article's actually boring. So I love that you do that. That's so amazing. Um, now, so you're talking about it was a long time coming. It's like, uh, the, a rapper's first rap album, right? It's, it's a culmination of their whole life leading up to that point. It's got depth. It's got grit, all that stuff. So you just out of the gate, have all this perspective. I cannot get enough of how, how do you keep that going though? Cause you do, I keep going, what else is he, what other perspective? Cause sometimes I'm watching these and I'm going, couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. And then other times of going, oh, I never thought about that. So like, how are you balancing? Cause you've been doing this for a while. How are you balancing um, that process of, you know, it was a long time coming with, okay, I've done a bunch of videos. I've done a bunch of articles. How are you keeping that going? 
Yeah. So a big one is direct interaction with the community, with people who pitch me ideas. Like yesterday, I reposted a video that I did last year before my account was taken down, which so many of us have experienced in the myco or psychedelic community. I posted a video about an ayahuasca live stream because I spend time on TikTok. I've taught multimedia to Gen Z who were telling me about TikTok in 2017, 2018, like right from the get go. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. A whole new cycle of social media for a whole new generation. And I saw this overlap a lot with people wanting to share all of their psychedelic experiences on social media. I think that can be great, but also I would be concerned if I was just coming to psychedelics or mushrooms or something right now with all of the noise that's out there, right? I feel again, like I was very fortunate to come across mushrooms before I even had social media. So that forced me to develop my own perspectives, to develop my own relationship with the mushroom. Sure, I was reading Arrowhead and this and that and the other, but now I go on social media and it's just this fire hydrant of all kinds of perspectives, all kinds of information, some of it really questionable information, right? Including coming from the top down, coming from the more corporatized space about like, you know, there's a narrative that you have to do psychedelics in a clinic and you, you have to do mushrooms with a therapist. That's a very popularly framed perspective right now. And I, I'm pretty open-minded about different ways people want to do things. But yeah, so I made that video. And um, after that, somebody was like, hey, you should do one on 5-MeO-DMT. And I hadn't really considered it, right? But it was it's that kind of feedback from people. Another friend of mine is a therapist. And last year, he said, he sent one sentence that just said, you should do a video on the spiritual bypassing coach. Another friend sent one that said, hey, I have this idea of like, instead of gentrification, gentrification for all the people who go to Cabo San Lucas or wherever, Tulum, or, you know, Bali, and then they decide to move there and it ends up being a gentrification. So that, that's part of it. And then I really treat it like improv, which I always try to emphasize, like, some of the perspectives, some of the, the videos and skits I do, they're very much a top of mind improv exercise with the understanding that I'm going to keep moving forward. So I know that there are going to be videos that rub people the wrong way, that don't land, that don't work, but those become a lot less of an issue when it's one out of a hundred videos. And the same with my co-preneur podcast. My goal is to get to 1000 podcasts. I feel like that's something that's within my control. I could never control if I have a million listeners necessarily. I can't control if I make a million dollars, but I can sure as hell control if I'm working towards a thousand episodes release. And for example, I think 144 is coming out today or tomorrow, episode number 144. Nice. You know, I'm so much better of an interviewer, podcaster, creative than I was at episode 44 or episode four. Don't so it's figure. A, right? It's a, yeah, it's the same as you're writing music. Like, most of the people who break through in music have written 500 songs or a thousand songs. Not all of them, but there's a lot of them. Like Bob Dylan has what, like 70 albums released, you know, hundreds and hundreds of songs. Yeah. Of course, he's got a bunch of number one hits and a bunch of classics because he's put out or written a thousand, two thousand plus songs. So that's part of how I approach it and part of what motivates me to keep moving forward. I feel like that that's sort of informed by your uh, sports background as well. You know, show up to the field how you get better at playing basketball swing a bat throw a ball catch a ball right if if you keep doing that it's it's gonna happen i love that i think that's great that um that is what is in your control yes and wow uh gentra vacation <laughs> that is fantastic um so you do a lot of uh biting satire now what i can deeply relate to is absolutely loving this community and almost simultaneously throughout the day intermittently wanting to wring this community's neck because it's like you just said um you know you don't even some of these people like so a lot of my audience very 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 cultivation centered and we have people who will sneak into a group, tell everybody they're great, acquire whether they buy or they, they are gifted a bunch of genetics, and then they peace out and go sell it all. 
they do none of that work, none of the the months or years of cultivation work that it took to to generate a new cross or an isolation or something like that. And they're just off and running with with no respect for for the work that was done before that, just sort of uh, appropriating it. Um, I talked with a, a book author, Rachel Harris. Um, she was talking about how, you know, you go have a couple ayahuasca ceremonies and all of a sudden you you want to be a, 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 a spirit guide and, and you're ready to, you know, move to Jamaica and start your own retreat center. And <clears throat> I know more than talk to her about these ideas than you had a video where you're literally making that that satire. And I, I just, I, I love that. But maybe talk a little bit about the the not love hate relationship but the the um positive slash critical relationship that that i'm assuming you have with this community you have to love it or you wouldn't do all this for it but yet yeah yeah i think that you just mentioned it it is kind of a love hate one i'm definitely more of a lover i'm more of the I don't really have too many problems with people because I don't want to hold a grudge. Like if somebody does me dirty or something happens, I usually just try to take the high road. And like, as they say, the best revenge is living well. And from personal experience, like if you've, if I've had an issue years ago with a close friend and I just spent so much time just like focusing negative energy that it ended up just poisoning and contaminating me. And I think, you know, those are actually, again, blessings in disguise. When something happens that rubs you the wrong way, you say, all right, maybe that's more on me. I can't control that person's actions. And yeah, there's always going to be opportunists. There's also always going to be unscrupulous, bad actors. And that's going to happen in the, in the underground and in like polite, legitimate, quote unquote, society. I think that's a misconception. There's this idea that like the underground market, the community, the black market, like that's such a negative connotation, the illicit market. Well. You know, there's plenty of therapists who abuse their power. There's plenty of corporate interests who abuse their power. Often, I'd argue that might even be the rule rather than the exception. So I think the move is to not take anything personally. It's really hard to learn that. But to be like, whatever that person does, like the world is a small world. The myco community, the psychedelic community, that's a small community. And like one of the things that I'm I'm most happy to hear is when people mention to me, they're like, Hey, we met you and we hung out and you were so nice. And then also a lot of people when you're gone, just talk about how nice you are. And like, mm. you know, that doesn't always come through on social media because I very much am playing a character a lot of the times. But I think that that's what I go for is like, hey, I'm going to try to steward the community that I want to be around and like talking behind people's back, like, you know, name calling. It's kind of childish. Like, yes, you should call out bad actors. OK, but then like when you make your whole focus about you're trying to bring someone down or you're trying to skirt on the surface and cut corners and you know pass off other people's hard work as your own like that has a tendency of getting back to people and even if it doesn't it's not my prerogative to punish that person so i think just any community in general like it literally happens in every profession every community same thing when i was teaching like there were teachers that were just kind of like difficult to be around and, and then i realized like i don't have to be around them like if i do i can uh you know i can deal with it uh, but I don't have to sink down to someone's level. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I noticed, too, is like I left the U.S. in 2020 and it had been a long time coming. I still like a lot of things about the United States. Like, I don't want to put it out there like, oh, the U.S. is a sinking ship or whatever, which is kind of a popular narrative, unfortunately, right now. But like when I left, what I noticed is that a lot of that surface level drama that I had been around or encountered just wasn't really here in my mm. where I live now. And then when I came back, I, I often come back to the US for conferences, events, seeing family or whatever, like all of a sudden that drama is still there. So I, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of examples of this in the micro community. The one other one that drives me crazy though, is when like, it is an underground community, right? So a lot of times like you don't really know the people, like you might know their Instagram, you might've met them once or twice, but people will sometimes like look at me as like an arbiter. Like they're like, oh, this person is very public. You know, I use my real name. I use my face. And then they'll send me these messages about like, you shouldn't interact with this person or you shouldn't do this. Or, but then the other person is sending me messages. And like, I kind of have to just like not even reply. You know, it's like, hey, whatever your beef, whatever your drama is, like right. I have zero to do with this whatsoever. And like, I'm not here to be, you know, the arbiter of people's character and morality. Like if I have a direct interaction with someone, 
I might say like, yeah, that person fucked me over. But again, good luck to you. You know, you go on your way. It just means that I don't really have room where I'm headed for bringing people who want to, you know, do other people dirty and and uh, contaminate the well for everyone. Like that. Yeah, they're, uh, it's, it's easy. It's, it's like that old saying, uh, the Native American saying of there's two wolves in your mind, you know, which one are you going to feed the good wolf or the bad wolf, the, the positive wolf, the negative wolf. And, uh, I mean, I'm afraid of wolves in general, so I, I, I not super into that, but yeah, you're right. You have to do it. It's getting hard these days. I, I can, I can tell you that in, in our community, uh, with people flooding in, and everybody's looking to make a buck, you know, it's the blue rush, right? Everybody's trying to make a buck. So everybody's stepping on everybody's toes. Holy cow. It's a, uh, it's a trip. No pun intended. All right. Question for you. Were you always funny or is this a newfound skill? Is this more in your, you know, as a satirist or is this more, um, you know, that, that, that skill kind of brings out the humor, like a David Sedaris type of thing, or you just always been the class clown funny guy. That's a great question. And one I've had to think about in the last couple of years, since I really started being more forward facing with the humor, I did win class clown in high school. So I guess there is that precedent. Like I went streaking in high school in my sophomore year, you know, it's always kind of the oddball. And I, I honestly think that's a coping mechanism. It's like, mm. you know, you're around circles. I get invited to a lot of cool events now. And I don't always speak like the most academic, scientific, corporate business language. So like humor, I think is kind of a response to that where I can make connections between different things I see. Mm. And I realized like through all the traveling, laughter, humor, they translate really, really well. You could not even speak the same language as someone. And if you can make them laugh with your body language, your antics kind of being a dancing monkey it ends up really breaking the ice really endearing you to people so that's a big one i just kind of noticed that it works really well and that there's a deficit of humor right now you know like we live in a very serious very difficult in a lot of ways timeline especially the news cycles it's just constantly being blasted with negativity escalation of a military conflict oh there's a pandemic oh maybe there's it's mutated it's just like this never-ending stream of very serious difficult serious considerations and humor seems to be a defense against that it seems to be like oh you know in and of itself laughter is so healthy for you, like physiologically, right? Like it's really healthy to develop that almost trauma response where you can look at something and laugh. And then also a lot of trips can be very, very funny. You know, this idea that like psychedelics need to be so uber serious. I appreciate that they're extraordinarily powerful tour, uh, tools and should be used with respect in a lot of cases. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to have a good time, have a good laugh, you know, that in and of itself can be so cathartic. Like for a lot of people who come to mushrooms, that's one of their primary takeaways is like you hear, I couldn't stop laughing. And then oh, the yeah. next moment I was crying and I didn't know I was crying, but like that's something really beautiful about being with a group of friends and like straight up first time I ever ate mushrooms, we went to the Del Mar Fair in San Diego, had my half ape, like I mentioned. And then we went to see a band play. It was Ozo Motley, but before Ozo Motley mm. came in, and played the opening band was mini kiss which are a bunch of little people dressed like kiss so like this was my first time tripping and peeking and there's this like band of little people dressed like kiss and i'm in the front row and like and they were loving it too like they exist as a sort of comical tribute act and it was so fun just like the whole experience just yeah. you know walking through the fair seeing people act very like mechanically and you're just kind of like increasingly growing unhinged laughing I think that's my takeaway from a lot of my psychedelic experiences is that we absolutely live for for no, for lack of a better word in a miracle like it's an absolute miracle no matter how good our science is right now we have no idea like the mechanisms underlying what happens like where do you, where do you come from where do you go what happens after you die like all we have are a bunch of theories right so I think that's one of the takeaways is like what if you could just appreciate the fact that we got to live this incredible experience and, and we're here. And I think psychedelics kind of hopefully empower people with that perspective to think like yeah. we've reduced so much of this incredible, magical, childlike experience of living into this like very structured, rigid, 
routine of like, oh, shit, I got to get up. I got to go to work. Like a lot of that stuff, I think psychedelics potentially can undo that conditioning and get you back to this situation where you're like, hey, I'm just stoked. Like, well, I have a body. This is awesome. Well, I can go swim in water. Like, this is great. And it's that childlike sense of looking at the world, right? Before you got corrupted, before your mind was so focused on whatever triviality and bullshit you have to deal with today. Like just that simple fact that we are alive, that most of us are in very good health. Like these are, you know, comparatively, like I'd argue almost everyone uh, listening to the podcast is in pretty good health. So um, yeah, that's kind of my takeaways of it. It's just like, let's be weird. Let's not normalize being unhappy, automatonic uh, cogs in the machine. Man, I love that. So first off, my early experiences with mushrooms the whatever pathetic little crumbly bag of shrooms that we got from from this farmer's son down the road um i don't think any of us ever actually ended up getting you know a a, a full legitimate trip dose so we always had these sort of like light visuals a lot of euphoria low, low body high uh but those nights were always just hilarious and i was already with all my friends that was like the unifying bond of us was, was humor so man tripping on shrooms that was just a, a, a good time and i remember uh interviewing this guy uh fun guy mycology and we were talking about this idea and he said well i mean he said feeling good is therapeutic it's like you know it's it's good to want to feel good if, if mushrooms make you feel good that in and of itself you don't have to go any deeper into it than that but they make you feel good. Great. That's, that's a therapy. So I love that playful idea. I love the idea that man, society just wants to just pull all the fun out of everything we have. Everything has to be in America. Anyway, everything has to be commodified. Like what's your angle? I can't tell you how many times people message me. What's your end game with, with this? I'm like, I don't know, man, this is fun. This is a fun midlife crisis for me. I'm if I can make some money, I would like that. I mean, um, it, it takes time to do all this. It's costing me dollars. But like the primary motivation is I love getting to meet all you guys, talk with you guys, pick your brains, learn things from you guys. This is this is like the best. This is what it's all about. So I, I love that. I love that you're emphasizing that. Um, and your videos clearly demonstrate that the the play is is alive and well in in dennis's world for sure um all right got a couple questions for you here uh do you make all the videos absolutely by yourself do you have to set up the tripod do you have to uh, or do you have somebody that helps you film them sometimes so for a while, I had my wife holding the phone is about all it was. And she has a background in media production as well and has produced content and campaigns for huge companies and defense industry and things like that. So that gave me a badge of courage in a way to like really go out there, especially with the podcast, because when I first launched everything, there's a sense of wanting to really be top tier. Uh, you know, so having her support me was huge in that. And uh but honestly, she's grown so busy with other projects and I've kind of dialed into my own routine for how I do things that it's at this point, just me. And part of that is because I have a workflow dialed in where, you know, I have a turnkey studio. It's really, really simple setup. I'm a big believer in the phrase. It's a poor craftsman that blames their tools uh, or as my high school baseball coach, maybe less politically correctly said, it's the Indian, not the arrow. Right. So I've always kind of taken that mentality that even with just a phone, with a cheap lavalier mic, with a ring light I bought for 15 bucks on Amazon, I can create really quality content. And I'm pleased to say that Michael Preneur recently won Media Company of the Year at the Wonderland Awards, where the other nominees are publicly traded companies and companies that have serious venture capital. So the idea that like you can actually make an impact and, and it doesn't have to be where you have a red camera and you have you know super expensive tech and you have a producer and a PR team. Like I think that actually a lot of what I've learned from mushrooms is that creativity and resourcefulness are going to serve you very well in the long yeah. run. So I'm a proud bootstrapper. I have a very minimalist setup. And again, it forces you to focus on the content rather than the production. I know a lot of people who are not doing a podcast or a media component to what they're doing simply because 
they think they're not good enough. And, you right. know, they're asking me, what about this software? What about this? What about that? And like, yeah, there's a degree of editing or of tools that you can use that will significantly and immediately improve the quality of your content. But at the end of the day, like there's so much AI driven, overproduced, you know, expensive media that doesn't really resonate with anyone. There's something kind of DIY that resonates with people where they're like, oh, that's that's, you know, you're a creator who's creating from the heart and not with this huge budget behind you. So, right. yeah, right now it's kind of all me that I've been doing it. And um, I've looked into the possibility of expanding and growing, uh, but I want to do it in a meaningful way. I think that social media really exacerbates and amplifies this need for people to grow really quickly, scale really quickly. Same thing with mushrooms. And it's one thing I always try to touch on with, with podcasts like this is, your audience, I'm sure, knows this, most of them, but like a lot of people who get into the, the blue rush, as you phrased it, they're incentivized to try to grow as quickly as possible, as fast as possible, as big as possible. And a lot of times you're applying this lens that comes from the, you know your other experiences in life into, into the mushroom community, and it's very different. They're not always congruent. You know, I, I know people who just had their first microdose last year and now they're trying to scale. They want to be a thought leader. They want to build a million dollar business. You know, somebody hit me up and, and I try to entertain all queries and possibilities and collaborations to whatever extent possible. But they just got into this space and then they're trying to raise a million bucks and they're like asking me to connect them to my whole network. And I'm like, slow the fuck down. You know, like there's people who have been doing this for a long time. And most of the people who got into mushrooms before it was a thing, they're not bottom line driven, you know? Yeah. You got to make some money. You got to find out how to be economically sustainable. But my type of myco community people are the types who are giving away extra liquid cultures in the order, you know, yeah. and they're, they're giving lion's mane to veterans or, you know, in a philanthropic endeavor, like to me, from the get-go with a lot of the companies that I profile and people that I work with with Mycopreneur, that's what gets me excited about their product. It's not just necessarily they have the highest psilocybin concentration and they have the best genetics. Like those are awesome. But what about like what you do with your whole, you know, the way you approach your work, the way you uplift your community? Like those are things that I think speak volumes and that a lot of people who I would say are in it for the right reasons, which maybe is a little gatekeepy, but that's how I feel. Like they're not just thinking about mushrooms as widgets and units. Now, conversely, there's a lot of this corporatization of psychedelics and mushrooms where people are thinking about their returns. You know, it's like, hey, we've got investors and we just took on this chunk of VC or whatever. And I question the sustainability of that long term. And I think that's why a lot of the quote psychedelic renaissance, the market has crashed. And, uh, you know, like, uh, so just to round out this thought, I've always kind of felt like I work for the mushrooms in a sense. Like, you know, I, I kind of work for them. It's like, hey, I have these experiences. Now my life is working out pretty well. Uh, and I don't need to get it twisted and think that, you know, I need to commodify and extract value from these things. Right. Like, how can you try to commodify and extract value from something that could literally change change a person's end of life quality of care, you know? So like for me, a lot of my friends and going back many years, it's like, I just want to give them mushrooms. And I know that gifting is a huge thing, right? And in, in the, the mushroom circles now, it's like, I just want to give people mushrooms. Like, I, I don't need to charge you 3,500 bucks to come and sit, you know? And, and uh, so again, I'm still evolving my perspectives on all this, but like, I, I don't really uh, see the value in trying to reduce everything that a mushroom experience is and that the micro community stands for to a simple balance sheet. I think that's yeah. kind of grossly misunderstanding the project. Well, and you, so to reference uh, Rachel Harris again, she had said uh, in her interview, she goes, you know, we are framing the psychedelic renaissance for its medicinal value, its therapeutic value, uh, and then we're framing it under the, the umbrella of its legality, but she's like, no one is really trying to formally frame it for its spiritual value. And, you know, you might in, for you, we might include the, the, the spirit of play, the spirit of, of, of joy and all that kind of stuff that a psychedelic experience can definitely bring, but we're not. I mean, this commodification thing is no joke. I'm seeing it rapidly increase. Um, I had, uh, I watched a little short video a couple months ago. It was that Gary V guy on YouTube 
And he was hosting a little, I guess he makes big money doing a little retreat, bringing people in. They pay super high dollar fees to, to hang out with this guy. So this guy asked him a question. He goes, so, you know, I've dropped a hundred K. I have investors. I have the state of the art studio. I, I'm 30 episodes in and I only have this many subscribers and I only have this and I only have that. Uh, and he's like, so how long is it going to take? And Gary goes, well, it only took me 14 years. Totally. And and the look on that dude's face, because that's the difference, right? That's like, oh, you want to be a rock star? You want to be Slash? You got you to gotta sit down with that instrument and sound terrible for a long, long time. You got to actually enjoy that process. So you got to love the mushrooms. If I don't have this podcast, I'm still growing mushrooms. I still like psychedelics. If if I'm not uh, selling sterilizers, all the little things that I do to be a part of this community, if those are all gone, my relationship with mushrooms is exactly the same. I'm still sending swabs to people. I'm still giving away fruit. I'm still doing all that stuff because that's my core of this stuff. Commodifying it. That it always runs the risk of souring it, man. <clears throat> I was uh, a, a trumpet, a very good trumpet player. Uh, when I was younger, I toured Europe uh, one summer and that first real professional gig I had just showed me like, wow, bro, you are going to hate being a professional paid musician. You're going to hate it. It's going to ruin everything you love about music. And I just stopped and I didn't touch music for like another six years. I, I came back to it, but yeah, it's that the minute money enters the picture, it changes it all. It changes the changes just everything. Uh, okay, so enough about that. Um, biggest criticisms from your audience. What what have been the most hurtful, the most poignant, the most significant? criticisms you've received uh through all your endeavors here with micropreneur um that actually resonated with you and maybe gave you pause gave you points to ponder i think you know where i'm going with this totally yeah so i've been really fortunate to receive a lot more praise than criticism and i do appreciate valid criticism and what i end up getting a lot is uh random haters who are totally unfamiliar with my body of work. I think that's what happens on social media. Uh -huh. It's like people don't follow what you're doing. And then what discourages me about that is that I really like to and feel equipped to take on a lot of hot button subjects, geopolitical issues, real, you know, issues like what's going on right now in, in Israel and Palestine. And I was making content there on the ground in 2021 and like literally in refugee camps and was getting a lot of good feedback, including mm. from some of the most reputable international organizations of people who say like, hey, you're actually paying attention, you know, and, and I want to be able to take on hot button issues and be nuanced and be fair and, and look at it from a kind of independent, less biased perspective. But it's difficult to do that because of the climate of social media. So like obvious examples of that when I revisited this subject of Israel and Palestine, and, and honestly, like it's being studied right now, the possibility pretty intense of psychedelics actually positively impacting the relations in that region. There's a number of different peer reviewed studies, clinical trials happening. It's been covered in a lot of high profile outlets and I have friends and associates who are involved in the research. None of that translates to when you make a video and then the trending topics come up and then you get bombarded with people from outside of your audience. So that's one of the things that, a criticism that really, it sticks with me because you get these people, literally I had 400 comments on one of these videos I made and every single comment that was positive were people I knew. And, and mm. you know, people I knew would be emboldened to even criticize me if they wanted to. But in reality, all the critiques were coming from people who had never seen a micropreneur video before, who had no frame of reference. And so that's one example. But like having hosted the exchange students, having grown up also in a very religious context, like my grandfather has led a dozen trips before he passed over to what my family calls the Holy Land. You know, so I grow up thinking about, hearing about, reading about, and I want to frame it from my perspective, which includes on the ground footage and interviews with people 
over there. And it just becomes totally non-viable because it, all of a sudden you get this huge escalation of animosity coming from both sides, you know, coming from this side thinks you're, you're biased on that. And then the other side is saying, you're like, okay, well, this disincentivizes me from taking on more of these nuanced topics and infusing my perspective on them. And I did the same with Ukraine and Russia when it happened. So, you know, like one of my best friends, including someone who was an early advisor to the podcast and said, you should do this. One of the voices that I take very seriously in my life. And I launched the podcast partially directly because he was advocating that I should share my experiences publicly. And he was writing op-eds for mainstream media sources, like major New York Times level publications about the Ukraine Russia conflict that was going on. So a lot of these things, like they're, they're thoughts that I've been ruminating on, I've been investigating them. And I think there is an intersectionality a lot of times with psychedelics and with mushrooms. And, you know, that's a loaded concept, but the general idea and someone I just interviewed actually just wrote a book where she makes these arguments, Madison Margolin, uh, which is about psychedelics at their best can lead to expanded thinking, new ways of thinking, right? Of course, this could be hugely beneficial in geopolitical, social, environmental conflicts. Like, what do you need to solve problems? You need to think about them in a new way. You need expanded thinking. Right. So those are the criticisms that have stuck with me the most because it also sours, potentially sours relationships with people in the community. Like after what's unfortunately recently happened and is continuing to happen in the Swano region, we'll call it the Southwest Asia, North Africa, which I guess is a decolonized term for Middle East. Nevertheless, it really divides people all over the planet. And then it sours a lot of friendships because we can't even talk about it. You know, you, you can't even explore the possibility of a resolution without inviting all of this animosity and scrutiny and and it's disheartening. So I'd say that's the criticism that sticks with me the most is people saying that you're unqualified and you're out of line and you're this and that. And then I think, well, shit, I'll just go make another video in my Speedo right now. Like I could literally do that same video over and over where I'm in a Speedo dancing around in public and it will go viral. And I've learned that. Like there's certain things you can do that are going to get you a lot of views, but you also run the risk of being pigeonholed into that. You know, case in point, there's a guy and Props to him for killing it, but he does the kombucha, blessings in kombucha. He's a viral sensation from South Africa, I believe. Every video is him in a Speedo or swimsuit saying blessings in kombucha and throwing kombucha around. And every single video gets hundreds of thousands to millions of views and shares. And I realized like I can do exactly that. And I found something that works. But then I also want to be able to take on different issues and like kind of, you know, eventually the end game with Michael Preneur, I think, is to be more of a mainstream or more like serious media outlet. And I say that even with satire, uh, it, it is serious. I consider The Onion, Stephen Colbert, yeah. like Sasha Baron Cohen, like these are very legitimate yes. news outlets. And that's kind of what I always, my North Star uh, for Mycopreneur is to be that in the psychedelic space, to be taken seriously. And oftentimes it is, but like it's 100% satire bullshit. And then I occasionally stray away and do a more serious thing. And those are always the videos or the articles that fuck me when I get serious. Like if you stay in the satire lane, you're always going to be given a free pass in most, most uh, situations. But like when you start to get serious and share your perspectives, then all of a sudden you're opening yourself up to a lot of intense criticism. And it makes me kind of want to stick in my, you know, monkey dancing in the speedo satire, if I'm honest. Yeah. So uh, the thing I notice is you got short form content, you got long form content. People who watch short form content, they want thongs, they want speedos, they want uh they want a kombucha guy. They they want simple and entertaining primarily, visually entertaining. The long form people, I've done five hour podcasts. We've talked about growing mushrooms for five hours and we only ended it because out of just sheer exhaustion, it was like three in the morning. I had to end the podcast. We could have kept going for another five hours. That's a different viewer, right? That's, that's a viewer that wants every little detail, every option, every nuance, every thought. And so you got this balance, right? And the, especially in the YouTube space, it's pushing me, make shorts. May, I mean, it's just inundating me all the time. You got long content. Why aren't you making shorts out of it? So fine, I'll do Opus clip. I'll make a couple clips. That was a complete waste of time as far as I'm concerned. 
but you have that balance. You want to do both. You want to be funny. But I think primarily from what I'm seeing, you know, the satire is a tool for uh, critique, commentary, perspective, contextualization, all that stuff. So please keep doing the the controversial stuff. Those people that don't know who you are. I had somebody who said that one time I I, I referenced you to somebody and they were like, I don't get it. Does he hate us? And I was like, just watch some more and don't be dumb about it. Just you'll, you'll, you'll figure it out here in a minute. And then they came back and was like, Oh my God, this shit's hilarious and, and thoughtful and accurate. And the things that you're portraying, I've talked to people about multiple times, like, man, people are always doing this. Do they not see this, this, this? And we can laugh about it. That cognitive dissonance, you know, triggers that laughter because we're going, why are we doing this when we believe this? And so it's, it's all brilliant. I, I absolutely love that stuff. Um, how about this? Are there, uh, I wrote this one down. Are there uh, particular aspects or stereotypes within the psychedelic community that you find just absolutely ripe for satire? Like who, who are the types? I thought you'd do more Wooks to be quite honest, but you actually, you know, Wooks are the easy one. You, you have so many more little gems that I, I, I love. So yeah. Talk to me about your favorite archetypes within this community. Totally. Yeah. A big one is just doubling down on feedback and the response I get from the audience. You try things and then one really lands and these characters that are very self important enlightened gurus i think are so right for satire the cult dynamics and i've been around these characters for sure like you know i don't love to name names i kind of take archetypes and just personalities but like yeah. especially traveling as i did for many years naturally gravitating towards more liberty oriented kind of like freedom of consciousness communities like i ended up in a lot of places like you know in hawaii and in tulum and in iquitos peru and in bali and you kind of meet these same archetypes of like very spiritually important people right who are like kind of have their heads up their ass in some way and this like this aura of spiritual authority that they cultivate that's very attractive to a lot of people it's how a cult works you know I remember when I first went down to the Amazon 2010 and I was, you know, guns blazing, super interested in ayahuasca. I, I you know, read this, 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 and this. And then the center that I ended up at, which a few people who are still active in the psychedelic community have passed through there. This guy who was running it, you know, you would think he's God, like the way that, he, you know, he knows how to travel in altered states on, you know, he knows how to interpret visions. Well, when you're kind of like new and fresh to all this, that's very appealing to just like, Hey, this person has done a ton of ayahuasca. They must know something I don't. And then uh, you realize that's not always the case. You know, certain people just kind of disappear up their own ass after a while. Like as much as there's the ego death experience, there's also the legitimate potential of ego amplification. And I think we're seeing that too, right? Like you see that in the cultivator community sometimes like my fruit's bigger. I won this competition. I did that. Like I recognize the value of hard work being uh, validated and recognized, but like there's this dynamic to it that's very questionable, I think, especially when you talk about like spiritual or psychedelic experiences. But case in point, I had one character who certainly inspired a lot of this other uh, satire that I've been doing, where I went to a retreat, I was invited by friends, I wanted to hang out with them. They're like, hey, let's go, we're going to do this. I go, okay, I'm going to go and do this. And it was in South America, Central America. And the guy was eating like 10 grams of mushrooms in the morning every day of his own retreat. And he would just make these insane proclamations about how like, well, you'll understand one day you'll get there. You know, these like really smug statements. And then he was having emotional breakdowns in the middle. They'd be like, hey, this whole day's scheduling events that we're supposed to do, he's having a crisis right now. It's like, no shit, maybe it's tied to the four or five consecutive macrodoses he's done while he's supposed to be teaching people about cultivation or whatever. So th that was like the, the sort of really overt dynamic, you know, and then the worst is when they do ceremony and they try to like carry that over into ceremony. It's like nobody can talk, but my partner is going to do a seven minute poem that she wrote and she's going to come around and she. Right. You know, it's just like, I don't want to be here at all, dog. Like and then yeah, the, the infantilization of psychedelics, that's another type of character i think it's like these people who know better than you they know more than you yeah. and i find a lot of that pretentiousness 
and the academic and the sort of medical community. Not all of them, obviously. There's a lot of really solid people doing really solid work, but I've also come across people who straight up say, which to me is hubris, that you should not be doing mushrooms on your own. You should be doing mushrooms with a therapist in a clinic. Okay, I can appreciate that's a valid outlet for a lot of people and that model absolutely should exist. But like the whole high horse, I know better than you, I get, I find to be an infantilization of psychedelics. Oh, yeah. You know, that fits perfectly into a hierarchically controlled psychedelic system, which, you know, this gets a little bit into the weeds, but I think it's where we're headed. And a lot of great thinkers have pointed this out for many years. Like we could be headed towards a much more rigidly controlled kind of brave new world style of psychedelic mainstreaming where, yeah, you want to trip. Okay. Well, you can have a microdose when you have two therapists there in this padded room, that's the only legal way we'll allow you to do it. You know, the idea of like, Hey, people can grow their own mushrooms and share them. Like no shit. It's illegal. Like it's extremely threatening to a lot of power structures. So right. I'm kind of caught in the middle of some of that right now. And I'm constantly trying to evolve my perspectives, but like this idea that like the California decrim bill got shot down because, Oh, there's not enough data for safety and all that. It's like, they're saying all this. And Gavin Newsom is saying this while my timeline is completely filled with state sanctioned violence and like people being tortured and blown up. It's like, that's okay for your mental health. You can get addicted to scrolling. You can get addicted to, you know, saturated fats and crappy food. And we'll redline this neighborhood and put Burger Kings and Taco Bells with bars on the window. And But you guys should be really careful. We don't want you eating mushrooms because you might go insane. Like, I think it's infantilization. I think it's bullshit. Yeah. And uh, and uh, one day I may up running for may end up running for some kind of local office to try to you know be a one party or one ballot issue platform, which is like let people grow mushrooms, let adults fucking make their own decisions. And if you break the law because you go kooky, you know I have a friend who got naked and punched a cop in the face. So I'm I'm well aware that there are potential risks to these things, but like. Cognitive liberty is sort of where I'm at, and that's increasingly being taken away from people. We're increasingly being told that, like, you have to do it this way. You're not smart enough. You're not, you know, you don't deserve it. And I question that very strongly. Cognitive liberty. Wow. Be careful. Watch your back, Dennis. Those, yeah, those are real. those are some serious. I mean, <clears throat> that's like you go back to if you think about Jesus Christ, he was a I'm pretty sure he was a real person. Um, he was walking around saying stuff like there's, there's a kingdom that no Caesar can rule. That's what got that motherfucker nailed to a cross. He said, forget these Caesars. There's a kingdom that can't be ruled by man, right? Cognitive Liberty. That's that same idea. That's it's a, these days, Right. Nobody wants it. Most people don't want to think about this stuff. Um, they are so numbed. Um, I, I mean, I feel like ultimately everyone does want to know these things, but man, we're so satiated. We got a phone. We got YouTube shorts. We got Dennis Walker. And I'm only going to lightly watch, you know, a couple of those. I just see a funny guy in, in, in the Speedo. That's hilarious. Um, how many people are going to go to the next level? watch a bunch of them and really start thinking about this. Like, wow, I'm a part of this community and I'm making decisions every day about my involvement in it. Do I want it to, am I just here for, am I a taker? Am I just here to take from this community everything I can get? Or am I trying to contribute to it? I, I say this repeatedly on the show. I say, cool, you're growing mushrooms. You're trying to, you know, maybe you're using it for healing. Maybe you're using it for recreation. If, if you're here for a while and you're not going anywhere, what's the, what's one more thing you can do that is a contribution to the community? <clears throat> not everybody's on board with that. Got too much, too much scrolling to do too much scrolling to do. Um, it's, it's scary. Uh, the, the psychedelic Renaissance, um, that, that term it's, uh, giving what's going on a lot of credit. It's romanticizing a lot of what's going on. And I don't, I'm not sure that that's the, the accurate term for it. I would love to believe that when it's all said and done, it turns out to be that, but I think you're right. I think it could be a sterilization process. I think it could be very much 
an Orwellian nightmare. It could be you don't get to grow mushrooms. Mushrooms are illegal, but our synthesized psilocybin is totally legal and available at every convenience store. Who knows how it's all going to turn out? I, I know with human history, it usually there's a lot of losers and there's a couple winners. So we'll, we'll see how it all goes. Yeah. And I always have to backtrack a little bit and say, this is part of why I do the podcast. And I host a lot of these more corporate pharmaceutical focused interests. And I'm also interested in learning their perspectives because from yeah. population level decisions, yeah, that's tough. Like I think we had mentioned this in a chat, but it was like, I, I often will critique what's going on. Well, what's the answer? You know, like right. it's easy to critique and deconstruct things, but like, okay, well then why don't you build a better mousetrap? Why don't you design a better system? That becomes very difficult to do, right? When you start thinking about the complexities at play oh in our God. world. So yeah, so I, I'm actively trying to do it, but at this point I've landed on the perspective that you need all of the models. You need the medical model, you need the religious access model, you need the decrim model. I'm very skeptical that any of those initiatives will hold up in the long run, quite, quite frankly, like facts. Decrim does not mean that you can grow as many mushrooms as you want and sell the mushrooms and nope. create a brand. Like a lot of people think, you know, people in San Francisco are like, oh yeah, it's totally legal now. It's like, nope, nope, it's absolutely not. It's it's a low priority, but it still is potentially a priority. So yeah. I always try to keep an open mind. And, you know, I've been in the room with a lot of these very powerful interests and make no mistake about it. Like a lot of the alphabet agencies, a lot of, you know, feds, et cetera, they're involved in what's going on. Like, there's no way that they're just letting this happen. So like, I think that's the other thing is, uh, you know, try to be aware of that. And when I interact with people, I often will say like, hey, I'm a satirist. You know, I do satire, boo, you know, big dancing. I'm, I'm not trying to pose a threat necessarily, but um, I definitely have my moments when I slip and I drop a hot take. Oh man, I've I've seen you uh, post like, oh, I'm going to this event. And I'm just like, do they know who they booked? This guy is not going to pull any punches. He's going to like, it's going to be a roast. Watch out. Uh, but that's good. And I actually, that makes me slightly encouraged. Hoping that, you know, some of what you're saying is getting through to some of the people. It's not going to get through to all the people at those companies, but if some of the people can go, ah, yeah, these are, you know, these are valid points. We need to look into this. Hopefully uh, you can affect some, some significant yet probably not huge change within these corporate cultures. Um, I think that's a pretty big win. And, and I would argue that you're probably the only one doing that right now in this space. Who else is having that kind of influence? that many other people that I I'm doubling down man. I'm going to turn up the dial. You know, I, I come to the conclusion that I can get deplatformed again, but that it really doesn't matter. Like what matters is being consistent, being authentic and trying to build offline, you know, trying to do these kinds of things or like you, you can't route everything you're doing with the expectation that, you know, you're going to live your whole life online all the time. Like uh, that's why I like the conferences too. Like, Quite, yeah. quite frankly, you meet people that you have a perspective or a preconceived notion about, and you're like, this is actually a really cool person. You know, I had to tell this guy recently, I went to dinner and met him uh, earlier in the year in Miami, and I, I told him, I was like, dude, you're so cool, and I thought you were such a dick. I thought you were like this corporate suit bro, and it turns out like the dude comes from a gangster upbringing, you know, and like, yeah. it's like, you can't judge books by their covers, but we all do it. You know, we all want to say like, this person's the enemy, this corporate figure's the type. And just to round out this thought, I think it was Donald Glover, I want to say, who said this, or someone of, of that caliber, like a well-known actor, who was just like, when everyone always talks about they, they're going to do this, they did this. It's like, who the fuck are they? Like, we are they, you know, like we are potentially going to be the the corporate types one day you might find yourself in a suit one day or like running a multi-million dollar startup we are they i think we are they we are they and unfortunately we are all these flawed people so all we can do is do our best try to evolve try to you know think about more things this is what i love about what you're doing is you, I mean, I like to think I'm a deep thinker. I like to think I'm thinking about a lot of this stuff. And uh, you're always giving me a little something extra, a little different perspective, uh, a deeper or a more subtle nuanced take on, on some of this stuff. 
And it's really important. There are other people like me in the space. They're definitely the, you know, the wooks and the people who don't care. They're not here for that. And they are a part of our community too. But there are a lot of people. And this is this is something I've been talking about a lot lately. I think that this little, you know, underground, illegal, schedule one community of mushroom growers that ex has existed for a long time, ever since, you know, Dennis and Terrence did their thing, we, that perspective, uh, that dynamic of the community is about to change because, and I'm already seeing it within the last couple of years. There are so many people coming into the space not motivated by, I'm going to sell fruit. I know this is a cool drug. I'm going to sell it to people. These people are coming in in droves, just going, I read an article. I'm going to give this a shot. Uh, I'm missing something in my life, or I can't stop smoking, or I'm depressed, I'm anxious, whatever it is. And the hype train for psychedelics, particularly mushrooms, is pretty strong. And so this community is just being flooded with these new people looking for answers and their own experiences and all that. And, and you being on Instagram, offering people a perspective of hold your horses, guys, you know, this guy might say, this is what the trip's like, it might not be that for you. You got to have your own relationship with this fruit. I think that's great. I was actually going to ask you, um, tell me about your logo. And I think you sort of answered it, but, um, yeah, if, if there's a little more to it than, than what I'm seeing, I love this, the balance between, I'm saying it's the balance between human interest and the mushroom interest and, and, and finding a balance there, but correct me if I'm wrong. That's a good one. And I'm pumped on the logo. It was one of those happy accidents. It just kind of came together and I come from a family with a law background. So like this idea of like the scales of Libra and of justice, oh. I think are very easy to understand for a lot of people. And one of the primary takeaways I've had from my psychedelic experiences and entheogenic experiences is sort of de-emphasizing and deprioritizing humanity's role as the dominator species on the planet. Like there's something really refreshing about trying to take us down a notch a little bit and being like, yeah, like we think we're hot shit, but like also, hey, maybe these other organisms, maybe mushrooms, maybe different plants and so on have evolved a really heightened level of consciousness. And like, and, and I think that's very accurate with mushrooms. Like most people who have a mushroom experience will assign a value of intelligence to the mushrooms, I think. And obviously that's another thing that's kind of getting sterilized out where you have people saying, oh, oh it's just an accident. Like it's just a poison. There's no reason that, the, you know, psilocybin is just a, an accident of evolution or whatever. It's like, well, that's quite an accident if that's the case, right? So yeah. this idea of humanity having a more balanced role in the ecosystem and seeing ourselves as one species in this beautiful tapestry of lots of intelligence because right now, the kind of 21st century worldview that a lot of people have adopted is nihilistic. And it's one of the, the world and mushrooms and nature. They're there for me to extract value out of. Like, that's the only reason that this all this is there for me to extract value. And I, I'd question that. And I'd say that, you know, a lot of people who have mushroom experiences, part of what maybe makes it dangerous to like a more authoritarian minded uh, um, civilization is that you really do start to become a little bit happier with less a little, you know, you're not, I'm not chasing an eight bedroom mansion and Ferraris in the driveway at this point, you know, maybe when I was a baseball player, that was the end goal. The end goal is to keep playing. You love the game, but it's that money. It's the contract, you know, it turns into a business and yeah. you, Shohei Otani just signed a $700 million deal. And like, that's the news. Well, at a certain point, you're just like, Dude, I'd, I'd be pretty stoked with like a nice 70K. You know, that would be nice. I'd have all that I need. I, I, and that's kind of where I'm at right now. And again, that like gives you pause to stay trying to climb the ladder and I need to get to the top of the pyramid. Like I think a lot of mushroom experiences for people will typically de-emphasize that and say like, yeah, it's cool. Like I'm, I'm not going to be out here preaching. Like we need to go live in the forest and, you know, eat berries and play with sticks. But like, I think that you become a little bit more comfortable with, 
your your place in the world, your community, the intangible things that you can't always assign value to, like humor. And uh, that makes it it's difficult to productize and to quantify a lot of that. So I guess that all comes back to the logo and the sense of hoping that there's a little bit better balance in the next era of humanity between human and human civilization and the ecosystem, which also lines up with a lot of the corporate or world governance goals. Like if you look at these global governance institutions like the United Nations, World Economic Forum, yada, yada, like most of the goals moving forward, 2030 agenda, which I kind of take a less cynical view of that in some ways than some people might, but it's about having hopefully a more equitable, more balanced civilization. Doesn't mean that's going to happen. Doesn't mean that everybody, you know, right in this legislation has the lowly people or, you know, bottom of the social pyramids best interest in mind. But I'd like to think that we're not being ruled over by narcissistic sociopaths, you know, maybe some of them, but I think there's a lot of good people in power. And I hope that the next chapter of humanity looks like that, where we're not placing these unrealistic expectations upon people that they need to be C-level executives and they need to fly private and they need to own, own, own. That like we can just be chill, having our little spot. It's clean, it's comfortable. There's some a body of water nearby. I've got my dog I love. That's life, you know. I've often told my wife, like, and it's happened a lot like this, where I'm like, dude, I'm I'm pretty cool making like 1500 bucks a month, you know, like that's, it's enough that I need in my circumstance to survive and, and be comfortable. Obviously money's good for a lot of reasons. And I catch myself slipping sometimes, but, uh, you know, it's also part of what's made micropreneur financially viable is like, I've totally lowered the operating costs for everything so that, you know, I don't, it's just as easy to waste one, one dollar as it, as it is to waste 10 million. And, uh, so I'm trying to just be thankful for what I have. And, and a big part of that is being thankful for the other companion species we share this planet with. That was a bit of a rant. Hope that was interesting. I, I love rants. Now, yeah. I, what I really love about your logo is that in, in this logo, the mushrooms are six foot tall. So I like that. Totally. Um, that would be amazing. <laughs> um, Man, I don't know your your mention about uh, wandering around the woods, eating berries, picking up sticks. That's kind of like my new great weekend. <laughs> it's like I don't. I mean, I tell you what, and it's I'm 47. When I was young, oh my god, the ambition! It's what drove me to get a screenwriting degree, be in a band, move to Hollywood, try to get a record deal, work in Hollywood. Da 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 da. Right? Because I just more do more do more accomplish more. And it never made me happy. I mean, there were aspects of it I enjoyed for sure. But as I've gotten older, 100%, it's, it's the simplest stuff, man. It's, it, it, it does not take much. Good food, sleep. Oh, my God, I got three kids. Let me tell you what I dream of all day, sleep. That is like, and then I think about how I squandered opportunities for sleep when I was young. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it doesn't take much. All these other things, that ambition, um, there's a, a Thomas Merton quote. I'm not a big, uh, I'm not big on quoting old Catholics, but um, he has a quote, uh, when ambition ends, happiness begins. It's this idea, man, the ambition, it's, it, it drives you to accomplish a lot of stuff for sure. And a lot of obsessive, ambitious people have accomplished and invented great things for humanity but boy it doesn't make you happy i mean it just it simply does not make you happy and i got a hot tip on the sleep end i don't know if you've tapped into amanita muscaria it's a woefully misunderstood mushroom for a lot of reasons that's become super popular i think mainly because magic mushrooms or entheogenic mushrooms are experiencing unprecedented popularity. And those are the legal ones, right? Like there's dispensaries selling them, there's brands. And I've been hesitant to tiptoe into it, but like I got some tincture recently that's specifically designated for sleep. And it has been amazing. I cannot speak highly enough about it uh, after repeated experiences too. It's, yeah. So totally, totally recommend it. And also of course, as with any big yeah, do your due diligence before you go charging in and, you know, going berserk on Amanitas. Yeah, so I was at the Ohio Mushroom Festival this summer, and there was a guy there who was selling all sorts of Amanita muscaria tinctures. And the people, I mean, that was the hot booth for sure. 
and people were just coming up talking to him about, oh, I'm so glad to meet you. I've been buying X, Y, and Z tincture from you. God, it helps me go to sleep at night, uh, helps me with, with anxiety. And it's so fascinating that it gets uh, sort of this iconic folklore around it of being like the ultimate, you know, uh, quintessential hallucinogenic mushroom when, when what it might be way more useful for is just like a little mild buzz, a little calming sedative effect. Yeah. It's fascinating how the stories we want to tell, right? Joe Rogan wants to tell the story about the reindeer piss and, and Santa Claus and all that stuff. Cause that's a cool story. But then the practical side of it, I think you're a hundred percent right. Um, it, it, it might have some pretty useful medicinal benefits. Um, I can't wait to try it out. I got them. I just got them. I'm getting them tested to make sure that the guy I got them from actually gave me what he said he gave me before I ingested. I'm, I'm being careful, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited to try it out. Totally. And just one more quick note on that. I submitted an article today for one of the platforms I write for called Leafy based in the United Kingdom that actually challenges and refutes that narrative or that myth that Santa Claus is a mushroom. And I appreciate a good entheogenic origin story as much as the next person. But through recent conversations I've had, apparently there's not really any primary evidence. And it's one of those stories that just gets told and it gets recycled. So I think I might get some criticism for that. Damn it, Dennis, don't ruin that for us. <laughs> That's the best story we got. No, I want to find out. I want to get to the bottom of it. I really do. I, and Amanita is fascinating. I think we're going to see a lot more about it coming out. And one fascinating thing about it is that there are many countries, or several countries at least, where psilocybin is legal and muscimol or ibutenic acid are not. Wow. And the US, that's reversed. Like psilocybin is illegal, but you can buy amanitas. Strangely enough, in the Netherlands, you can go buy psilocybin truffles and you cannot buy amanita products. So, like, I think that's part of what we're trying to wrestle with right now, sort of as a global society is we live in a global society, like for the first or second generation, you know, like we truly live talking about hosting exchange students and traveling all over the planet. The brands that exist are transcontinental. Coca-Cola, you can find in the smallest villages in Africa or in Mayan communities in Mexico. Yeah. So like our current nation state system doesn't really hold up in a way. Like when everybody, be you in uh, Pakistan or in Australia or whatever, you're all accessing Google and using these, you know, very global services, but yet our governments are still regional. And uh, I think that's reflected in drug policy. And we have woefully misaligned, inadequate drug policy. So that's something I want to do a lot more content around. It's like psilocybin mushrooms are actually fully legal to cultivate, transport, consume, and sell in a whole bunch of places. Nepal, American Samoa, Bahamas, Brazil, so on and so forth. Um, and why? Like, wh why can I go? Like Nepal, I can straight up launch an industry around them if I want. But then in the neighboring country of India, you can potentially be executed or right. have life in prison. Like that, that's totally asynchronous. And that's not a uh, legitimate framing of policy in the 21st century for my money. Man, it's fascinating you said that. Uh, when I was young, I was really into political science. I thought I was going to be go to Georgetown, be a poli sci major, work in government, all this stuff for a hot second. I wrote a paper called uh, Globalism uh, as a Public Bromide, and my whole take was that the only way globalism works long term is if like a, a, a United Nations like global government ultimately ends up being like the true unifying government for everywhere, specifically for reasons like that. You can't you can't be a global society but have these radically different, right? Like you can be killed in, in uh, Saudi Arabia for, for being a homosexual. Uh, Putin's gonna, you know, eradicate the gays. And then in a, com you know, another country, it's cool. These, these discrepancies, they just don't work long-term because everybody's trying to reconcile all these differences, right? Like, fuck, imagine being some North Korean getting his hands on a TikTok. Or some mushrooms. Actually, North Koreans Ooh. love mushrooms, though. I don't know to what extent uh, active mushrooms are available, but apparently they're a very mycophilic culture, and I find all of these things very interesting. The other bit I love about mushrooms is how truly global they are. Like, yeah. you have mycophilic and mycophobic cultures that might be a 
over reduction of them. But nevertheless, like there are folk stories and heritage around mushrooms from all over the place. And that's so cool. And Juliana Ferchi with the Fungi Foundation in Chile, they're doing some amazing work around this that's mapping out all of the different indigenous use cases of mushrooms around the world. And I got to hear her talk about it in Telluride at the Telluride Mushroom Festival, which I totally recommend for anyone who can make it out. And they have, the, Juliana's research team has documented the same types of mushrooms for the same types of uses in very geographically disparate places that historically had no connection. So like in a Norse or like Norwegian society, a tribe that uses mushroom, a certain type for carrying fire embers. I think it's some kind of polypore and Otzi the Iceman, right? From Italy was found with a few of these mushrooms. They're using that there. And then also in Paraguay, they found tribes who, you know, years ago, eons ago, were doing the same thing. And the same example, like in Australia, there are tribes, aboriginals who are using certain types of desert mushrooms in the same capacity as tribes in Mexico were using them. That kind of stuff is endlessly fascinating to me. And yeah. there's very little research into it because a lot of those cultures are oral, their traditions, which also loops back to why there's probably not a lot of primary evidence about Santa and a mushroom. Santa Claus and mushrooms is that there's no written evidence or, you know, cultures, A, might gatekeep it for obvious reasons. They don't want to share it because when a culture gets colonized, the first thing to go is the spiritual traditions. And it happened for Europeans too. I think a lot of people don't understand that. Like European indigenous uh, animistic worldviews and, and entheogenic mushroom use was colonized and was eradicated, oh, yeah. which expanded. So, but now we're starting to reclaim that. And I think that's what sucked me headfirst into the world of mushrooms is to realize like, this isn't something new. This is something very old that we're just reconnecting with. And it's very, very advanced. It's very intelligent and we shouldn't trifle with it or fuck with it. I think uh, that's, that's the other bit that I'd like to think has given me some good success is that you kind of recognize who the boss is and you're not necessarily the boss. You might think you are, you know, but uh, for any of the people trying to commodify and strip down and put mushrooms in a little box, I'd love for you to go do a 20 gram full send by yourself or, you know, something in that orbit and then come back and talk to me about how much we know with our clinical validation and our, you know, serotonin 5H2A agonist. There's value in that for sure. I'm not trying to dismiss it, but it needs to be checked and put in its place. I love that. Hey man, all I know is this. Um, we need more people like you in the community, people thinking about stuff, people who care, people who are willing to ask the right questions, poke the bear in the right spots. Um, I, I just can't, I can't give you enough props for what you're doing. I'm, I'm so glad you uh, oh, finally, we, we connected and, and could make this happen. Uh, hope to do it more often intermittently here and there um, because you're, you're just getting to talk to a lot of people. You're you're sort of like the um, comedic Alan Rockefeller, right? You're wow. out and about all over the place, um, and you're getting to talk with a lot of people who are trying to shape and influence what's going on in our community. So uh, love you for that. Um, really wish you nothing but further continued success. Um, I, I definitely look up to all the ways you're contributing to to this community by making fun of us all. I love that. Dude, you had one recently where I forget, it was like some of us starting a podcast and at first I was like, what the fuck? He's out. Oh, God, but complain about me by starting a podcast. And then I was like, no, yeah, this is great. Yes. You know, this is exactly true. Everybody wants to start a podcast now. Okay. Well, dude, thanks for the invite, man. I super appreciate it. And also want to shout out the audience and I hope that you enjoyed this. Thanks for letting me talk my bullshit. And I'm, very receptive to you know people reaching out and saying what's up so let us know you heard it i appreciate the community the opportunity to contribute and uh yeah i'm humbled that i'm honored so thanks again for the opportunity here all right guys so i will have all the ways you can connect with michael panur on uh d the description below um he he's got an instagram that you gotta check out he's also got a website you can listen to all his podcasts almost 200 podcasts at this point um, go take a listen. Everybody's always asking me, who else should I be listening to? I always say, oh, here you go. Here you go. Here's the link. Go take a listen. A lot of people love what he's doing. Um, please, if you're on Instagram, though, you got to go follow Dennis. Please do it. Um, thank you so much for being on, man. And we'll uh, talk again soon. Woo, 
let's go. Keep growing mushrooms, everyone. That's my call to action here. Keep yes. doing what you're doing. Share them. Blast them out far and wide. Spread the spores. Spread the spores. Love it. All right. Take care. Peace. All right, everybody. That was Dennis Walker. Michael Preneur uh, had a blast talking with him. Uh, he had a lot of great things to say. I encourage you guys to go follow him. If you're not already following him on Instagram, uh, you know, go check out his podcast. He's got almost, I think over 160 episodes. Uh, I really was inspired by what he said about, you can't worry about the followers. You can't worry about the likes and all that. Oh my God. Every episode, all we ever do like, 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 like it's great. The people who like it will like it. The people who are busy, you know, in their, in front of their flow hoods, listening to the podcast, they, they don't have time to like it. It's okay, guys. We love you guys too. All I'm going to do over here is just keep doing what I do. As long as I'm having a good time, I'm going to keep doing it. I think it was really cool to hear that perspective from him. Uh, so thank you, Dennis, for that. And uh, I really appreciate him taking out a little bit of time from his busy schedule. He is all over the place doing all sorts of cool stuff all the time. Super jealous. Um, hopefully uh, I get to meet him one day. If you guys are ever at an event he's at, say hi to him for me. Uh, I would appreciate that. All right. Until next week, you know what I want you to do. Go grow some mushrooms. Mushrooms.